be staring at me. Good morning, church. Let's wake up together. If you would, let's stand on our feet. Good morning and happy Sunday. Sadly, it's cold, but it's supposed to get warmer, I think. Hopefully, I'm tired of the cold. Uh, if you are new, welcome. Uh, thanks for joining us. We would love to get your info. Actually, all of you, we'd love to get your info. If you would like to get updates, you can check email listings. Um, we would love to get that and be able to take care of you and help you know what's, what's going on here at the church. Also, if you're new, you can fill that out and go out in the back or at the cafe. We have a gift for you, mug and our coffee that we serve on Sunday mornings. And next week is Easter. So we're excited about that and hope you guys all join us for Easter. I'm going to pray and we'll just continue worshiping. Dear Jesus, thank you for today. Thank you for this time where we can just come and celebrate and be in your presence um, and just continue to learn more about you and, and just know how we can further your kingdom. We just love you and praise you and are so thankful that we have this opportunity to be with you. We pray this in your name. Amen. Nothing can tear us from The grip of his mighty love We've only glimpsed his vast affection Heard whispers of 
his heart and passion it's pouring out it's pouring out it's pouring His love is fierce, His love is strong, and His furious. His love is sweet, His love is wild, His waking heart to life. Father loves and sends His Son. Son lays down His life for all. He lavishes His love upon he calls us now, his sons and daughters, he's reaching out. His love is deep, his love is wide, and it covers us. His love is fierce, his love is strong, and it's furious. His love is sweet, his love is wild, it's waking hearts to life. His love is deep, his love is wide, and it covers us. His love is fierce, His love is strong, and it's furious. His love is sweet, His love is wild, it's waking hearts to life. Oh, how great, oh, how strong. As we move into this time of communion, if you need the elements, they're in the back, or you can just raise your hand and somebody will bring them over to you if you don't have them. Um, it's Palm Sunday, and I was thinking about this this past week of just what this means and the importance. And I was realizing that Jesus came riding in on a donkey. And it seems so silly, but yet it's so significant. Jesus could have rode in on any animal. He could have rode in on a horse. He could have rode in on something that's so powerful and shows 
his power yet. He picked a donkey, an animal that is humble, that is hardworking, that just doesn't really show the power and authority that it has. It works quietly in the background. It does what it's asked. It does the hard task. It goes out of its way. It's just humble. It doesn't create a ton of commotion either. Um, And Jesus sent two of his disciples to go take a, a baby donkey so he could ride in on it. And later in Matthew 21, while he's riding in on this donkey, symbolizing that he is coming to serve, to be humble, and lay his life down, the crowd came, they laid their cloaks on the road, and cut branches off from the tree and laid him down. And then they started shouting, Hosanna, the son of David. Realizing who he is, what he has come to do for us. And it's in this moment where we get to set in his presence, go to him, be forgiven of our sins, be in communion with him, be able to share his bread and his wine and just become one with him and take this time to just really be thankful for what he has done for us and what he continues to do for us each and every single day. The humble servant he is, that he would leave his throne to save people like us, broken, sinful, wretched people, that he would do that humbly and willingly. I'm just so thankful for that. Dear Heavenly Father, just thank you for this gift, this gift of your son, um, that he would just be so humble and able to lay his life down for us and just really show his power and authority through his, his love and his care for, for the, your creation. And we just thank you that he is willing to, to do that sacrifice so that we can have eternity in you. We just come to you. Uh, before you and, and just give all the thanks to you for that. We pray this in your name. Amen. Please stand and continue to worship with us. I love you, Lord. 
Well, good morning to you all. Good to see everybody this morning. Uh, I got a text from Rana, our missionary to India, and he just wanted me to thank you all. Thank you that, for the opportunity to be here last week and share his work with us. Thank you for your prayers for him and his ministry. Continue to pray for them. And he wanted to thank you for your generosity last week. We gave you the opportunity to give a little extra to support him. And uh, you gave over $3,000 last Sunday to help, to help Rana on his way. If you wanted to give and you haven't had an opportunity or you uh, forgot about it, uh, you can get on our church app and there's a place there where it says give and you can page down and find Rana and give whatever gift you'd like to to Passion, Passion Ministries in India. One of these weeks leading up to Easter, we're checking the source, the Word of God, uh, ultimately Jesus. The approach we've been taking is to examine a few of his famous I am statements. Seven times Jesus uses those words to illustrate to us another way of understanding precisely who he is and exactly what he's all about. And, and of course, we should not miss the connection made there with his heavenly father who used, who used those very same Words when he spoke to Moses at the burning bush, he said, I am that I am. So when Jesus would begin his explanations by using those same words, he was letting us know, I am God in the flesh. Darren talked to us about when Jesus said, I am the light of the world, and uh, when he said, I am the bread of life. Let's look at another one today, maybe two. One of the most prominent uh, interviewers of the late 20th century was uh, Barbara Walters, or if you're a Gilda Radner Saturday Night Live fan, Baba Wawa. So you know how old you are if you think that's uh, humorous at all. (laughs) So anyway. Uh, Anyway, she interviewed dignitaries, uh, politicians, world leaders, celebrity, and she, and she asks some uh, pretty insightful questions sometimes. And now and then, though, she'd ask some pretty stupid questions, like the time she asked uh, film legend uh, Catherine Hepburn, if you were a tree, what kind of tree would you be? She came to my mind this week uh, when I was thinking of asking you a question this morning. I hope it's not as dumb as hers was. I, I don't know uh, what, uh, I don't want to ask you what kind of tree you would be, but my question to you is, if you were an animal, 
What kind of an animal would you be? Now, I did a little survey among some of you and got quite a few answers. Lions, uh, kestrels, uh, different, a few different animals. A couple of you said sloths. I won't, uh, I won't say who that was, but uh, that, that's pretty good, sloth. Uh, Bronwyn, uh, she didn't know what kind of animal she wanted to be, but she said, whatever it is, it'd be a crazy one. So if you know Bronwyn, uh, that makes some sense. When it comes to uh, that for myself, I, th I think I'd like to be an eagle. You know, you know uh, majestic for sure, but what appeals to me about being an eagle is the soaring. I just think that would be great. Now, really, a buzzard soaring uh, appeals to me more, but I can't go for their diet. So I'm not going to, I'll be an eagle. I think I could be okay with sushi. But uh, what about you? Is there an animal that comes to mind for you when you think of what kind of animal you'd like to be? Well, what comes to being identified with a specific animal, each of us may have a preference, but the fact is our animal emoji has already been chosen for us. The animal chosen for us was the inspiration of David's greatest psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. We, metaphorically, are sheep. Sheep are the most, are the most mentioned animal in the Bible by far, and much of those mentions are by way of comparing us to sheep. The Lord God was speaking affectionately of his followers when he said, they are the sheep of my pasture. In the days of Jesus, the entire population was, was very familiar with sheep. Whether you lived in a town or on the farm, you knew something about sheep because they were everywhere. And even in our American experience, up until about a century ago, in general, except people who lived in the very large cities, people understood something about sheep, at least a lot more than, than we do today. So nowadays we have to study a little bit to get the full effect of what the Bible teaches us about sheep and how that we are like them. Let's begin with a couple, let's begin with a couple of visuals about sheep. Now when you read the 23rd Psalm, uh, particularly that first part, man, it's, it's very bucolic and, and peaceful. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. We picture a flock of sheep leisurely, enjoying the quietness of nature, the safety, the serenity of the pasture, while being very calm and compliant. And I think that's accurate. That's an accurate description of us sometimes. Isn't, it, isn't that nice? I like the idea of being a sheep under the care and watchful eye of my shepherd. Don't you? Psalms 23 is the most famous because it appeals to us. We like to think of ourselves as the sheep of the pasture of our Heavenly Father. And we should think that way. But there, and there, there, there are those other times when, just like sheep, we get ourselves in a little bit of trouble. Isn't that us sometimes? One crisis after another, one stupid decision on top of the last one. So that too is why we are sheep. That's why we must have a shepherd if we hope to survive. And that's why God sent his son, Jesus. In chapter 9 of his gospel, Matthew tells us that when Jesus observed the crowds, that he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd, harassed and helpless. Now in other cultures around the world, like maybe China or Iran, or as we learned about last week, India, people might identify with being helpless and harassed more quickly than do we. 
Here in America, for so long, we have been shielded, to some degree at least, from that kind of stuff. We've been lulled into complacency, much like those in the church of Laodicea in the book of Revelation, where Jesus says to them, you think you're rich and wealthy, and you think you need nothing, when in fact you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Without Jesus, we're just as helpless and doomed as that sheep in that ditch. So I'm glad I'm with David. The Lord is my shepherd. Throughout the Psalms and the rest of the word of God, that idea is developed. The Lord calls, as I said, his own followers the sheep of his pasture. David's description in the 23rd Psalm is our favorite And then about a thousand years later, after David, Jesus comes along having compassion for sheep without a shepherd. Later in his time here, he personalizes his watch care over us when he talks about going out in the wilderness to rescue, to retrieve one of the lost sheep while the 99 are safe at home. And then he says in John chapter 10, turn there this morning, that's where we're going to be, John chapter 10, He says, I am the good shepherd. David says, the Lord is my shepherd. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. Now, that's one of those seven I am declarations that he makes a few verses earlier than where I want us to focus today. But before we do that, let's get some context. Back in chapter 9, let's look at that. Now, I'm just going to hit the highlights here, so you need to go home and read John chapter 9 this afternoon. It should take you about five minutes. Who has five minutes that they can spare this afternoon? Okay, if you're not raising your hand, I may call on you and ask how we can pray for you that you're so busy you don't have five minutes. Okay, everybody's hand goes up. I don't want to be called on. But really, five minutes, is that's all you need to read chapter 9. Now, Uh, In chapter 9, John tells us about this grown man who had been blind from birth and that Jesus restored his sight. Amazing miracle. It was another confirmation in the minds of those who witnessed it of the goodness of Jesus and the fact that God was with him. Well, that made the Pharisees furious. So they questioned the man and his parents in order or an effort rather to discredit Jesus. His parents didn't want to give their opinion about Jesus for being excommunicated. So they said, he's our son. He's an adult. Ask him. He can speak for himself. You see, getting kicked out of the synagogue was more than just being told you couldn't come to church anymore. Along with it came community-wide disgrace, a stain on your reputation. Well, The Pharisees asked the former blind man about his healing, but unlike his parents, it seems he didn't care what they thought. He gave his testimony and affirmed that Jesus had done this thing and that he was from God. When they probed him further, they said, give glory to God. We know this Jesus is a sinner. Now, this former blind man is the only man that that comes to my mind in the New Testament other than Jesus who got testy with these powerful Pharisees. They had looked down on him his whole life, so apparently he had decided that he couldn't care less what they thought of him. They never lifted a finger to help him when he was blind. In fact, they believed that he was blind because of some some sin of his parents. So he isn't afraid to make a couple of smart aleck remarks to them, and I appreciate a good smart aleck when it's done right. He replied, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, now I see. They continued to badger him, repeating the same question, trying to trip him up. Again, the smart aleck replies, why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciple? Well, that lit him up, and Matthew says they hurled insults at him. But he continued with the wisecracks and arguments until they got mad and said, how dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Well, Jesus heard about it. He found the man. 
and had a conversation with him. And in the course of their conversation, Jesus revealed to him that he is the Messiah. The man believed Jesus and he worshiped him. Now, Jesus didn't have this conversation with this man in private. It wasn't a secret. Listen to what Jesus says next. In verse 39 of chapter 9, he says, For judgment I have come into this world so that the blind will see and that those who, will see, or those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, What? Are we blind too? And Jesus said, If you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. Okay, that's a lot of background, but that's what brings us to the I am statement of the day. Chapter 10 begins like this. Now, Jesus hasn't moved to another venue. It's not a different day. Jesus is still speaking to this former blind man, to the Pharisees, and to all who were listening. Chapter 10, verse 1. I tell you the truth, the man who does not enter the sheep pen by the door, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The man who enters the door is the shepherd of the sheep. The watchman opens the door for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. When he has brought them out, all, when he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but they did not understand what he was telling them. Now, Jesus is describing a scene that was quite familiar to his listeners, but maybe not so much for us. There were sheep pens, usually constructed with rocks stacked upon one another. And those pens were all around the country. There were those pens on the outskirts of towns and villages. And then there were those, those, those excuse me, there were those pens way out in the wilderness in the pasture lands. The two of them were somewhat different, but both served the same purpose, primarily to protect the sheep. The pen allowed the shepherd to relax a little bit more than if the sheep were out in the open field. But the pen didn't completely eliminate danger, as Jesus just described. Now, there's only one doorway into each one of those pens. Jesus says in that doorway... There is a door. Now, some translations say gate. I don't know why. There's a Greek word for door, and there's a Greek word for gate. And both of those words are used in the New Testament. I think Jesus was pretty good about knowing exactly what he wanted to say. And here he uses the word door. I don't know that it's a big deal, but when I think of a gate, I don't think of something nearly as substantial as a door, especially uh, the kind of exterior door that, must, uh, that they must have used in those days. Probably pretty heavy duty. Jesus said the shepherd calls his own sheep by name. And he leads them out. They follow because they hear his voice. I was fascinated years ago when I first learned about this. How that there might be several flocks belonging to several shepherds, co-mingled in a pen, all together, all mixed up. But in the morning when they would go out, each sheep would follow its own shepherd because that sheep knew the voice of the shepherd. No need for branding, no need for ear tags to identify which flock they belong to. Each sheep knows its master. And not only would a sheep not follow a stranger, a sheep would run away from a stranger. After Jesus gives us this description of the pen and the door, John adds his short commentary in that last sentence that we read. He says, Jesus used this figure of speech, but they did not understand 
what he was telling them. Now they understood about how a sheep pen worked and how sheep followed their shepherd and, and about the dangers of strangers and the purpose of the door and all of that. John is telling us that these folks didn't understand the application of the sheep pen and the door. So in verse 7, Jesus tries to clear it up for them. Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, I am the door for the sheep. All who ever came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and out and find pasture. Now remember who Jesus is talking to. At this moment, he's responding openly to the Pharisees who oppose him. He's already told them that they are blind. Now he's telling them that they are thieves and robbers. And since, they, and since that's who they are, he is saying the sheep will not listen to you. Others who were listening in that moment, hearing this lesson, were the general crowds who had been hanging around them. And they were hearing Jesus denouncing their unacceptable leaders. And finally, remember, Jesus was speaking to this formerly blind man who had been excommunicated by those leaders that Jesus was condemning. This man was expelled, kicked out of Judaism. He, he had had his physical eyes opened and he had had his uh, spiritual eyes opened. He'd been kicked out of the religion, but he had been brought to Jesus, the author of life. Listen to what Jesus says next. He says in verse 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. The stakes could not be higher. The enemy of human beings is Satan himself. Earlier, just before Jesus had healed the blind man, he had called the devil a murderer and a liar. Here he adds thief to his resume. He's a murderer a liar, and a thief. And his entire rotten being is consumed with stealing and killing and destroying everything he can from God and from us. You know, in most human beings who have done evil, evil things, you might be able to identify at least one admirable characteristic or accomplishment. They say Hitler made the rain, uh, trains run on time. Saddam Hussein <clears throat> didn't persecute Christians. But that's not the case with our enemy. He has no redeeming qualities. He comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Now, Jesus inserts this vital information at this particular moment to drive home the lesson about the sheep pen. If that kind of ruthless enemy is prowling about, you better be protected. And in his warning, Jesus contrasts himself with our enemy. Enemy is at the door. He's a murderer. He destroys. But I have come to bring life. Not just life, but abundant life. Come to Jesus, and what do you get? You get life. But you get abundant life. A full life. A life that will reach its full potential and beyond. All because Jesus is the great I am. Now, as we already learned, there was only one door. 
to the literal sheepfold. And there's only one door to the spiritual fold of God. Of course, it's Jesus. Some of us, when we were children, sang that chorus, one door and only one, and yet the sides are two. I'm on the inside. On which side are you? A very doctrinally sound children's song. You're either in or you're out. That's pretty heavy duty for a child's song. A pretty exclusive way of thinking that is introduced to little ones. But you might as well learn it as a child because it is very clearly what Jesus is saying. There are not a hundred ways to God. There are not three ways to God. There are not two ways to God. There is only one way to God. Jesus makes it clear that his flock is an exclusive flock. It's what he's saying in his other I am statement. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, no one comes to the Father except through me. You've got to go through the door. And he's the door. Now listen, there's no doubt about it. Christianity truly is exclusive. If you're not a Christian, you don't get to go to heaven. It's a privileged class of people. But you know what? It's for everyone. There is no limit to the number who can come into the sheepfold of Almighty God. No one is ineligible. Jesus himself says so in Revelation chapter 22. Whosoever will may come. The apostle Peter writes, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But there's only one way to come. I am the door, he says. You must come through me. He's the door to salvation. He's the door to abundant life. And a big part of that abundant life is safety and eternal security. He's the door through which we must enter. But he's also the door that guards us, that protects us, provides for our protection. I don't know about you, but in these past few days since last Sunday... I've thought a lot about that girl in Rana's video from India who was being beaten by that crowd. I felt bad for her, but I feel sorry for them. Someone might observe that kind of thing and they might say, where is the safety and security? What are you talking about? Remember that Mel Gibson movie depicting William Wallace as he is leading the Scottish army and in his rousing speech before the battle, he cries out, they may take our lives, but they will never take our freedom. That crowd in India could have killed that young girl. Perhaps they have by now. I hope not. I pray that they haven't. But that girl was more powerful than any individual in that crowd. She was more powerful than that entire crowd put together who were being manipulated by the thief and the murderer who comes only to steal and kill and destroy. She is a contemporary example of the Apostle Paul's admonition, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. So we may adjust William Wallace and say, They may take our lives, but they will never take our abundant eternal life or our joy because our security is eternal and it is in Jesus. That girl has abundant life. Her abusers have a sad, tragic existence 
where they are trapped inside a cult of demonic domination by that thief who comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But he cannot destroy her. He cannot steal her joy. He, cannot ca- he can cause her to suffer for a short time, but he cannot take away her abundant life. I pray that somehow we, we will and can experience her kind of power in our daily lives, in the places where we live. Anyone can have it. Anyone can have it, but we must enter the sheepfold of God through Jesus, who goes on to explain how it works with another metaphor. It's not a mixed metaphor. It's it's a complementary metaphor. First, he said, I am the door. Now, in verse 11, he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Jesus had to earn his position. Not his position as the Son of God. Not his position as our creator. But as our redeemer and our shepherd. To be our redeemer, to be the shepherd of our souls, he had to pay a price. Before David became king of Israel, as he was about to face Goliath, he explained himself to King Saul. He talked about how he had killed a lion and a bear that had attacked the sheep. David put himself in harm's way in order to save his sheep, and he was victorious. Jesus put himself in harm's way. He could have vanquished his foes with a word. But instead, in order to be victorious, in order to become our redeemer, redeemer, in order to become our good shepherd, he gave up his life. No one took his life. He said the good shepherd lays down his life. He gave his accusers. He gave Satan permission to nail him to that cross, which was a critical error on Satan's part. But it was victory for Jesus, and it's victory for us. What about you this morning? Are you in the sheepfold of your father? As the children's song says one door and only one, and yet the sides are two. I'm on the inside. On which side are you? Why not make today, if that's you, if you're on the outside looking in, why not make today the day that you enter through the door of Jesus Christ and begin today living the abundant life that will last forever and ever? I'm going to say a prayer, and if that's you, or if you just want to ask more, know more about it, just meet me right down here in front. I'd love to talk to you about it. If you're ready to surrender your life to Jesus, boy, I'd love to baptize you in the name of Jesus this very hour. But we're here for you. Come and inquire more about who Jesus is. Let's stand and pray together. Father in heaven, thank you that... Uh, that this... That, that, uh, being your uh, sheep, being one who is in your sheepfold is something that is open to everyone. Again, whosoever will may come, our Lord has said. So I pray for that one or two or three or however many might be here this morning, that they will not postpone the decision to follow you because we never know what a day may bring, Father. And the enemy has come only to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I pray for those who need protection by him this morning. Lead us and guide us as we depart from this place. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Thanks for being here.